Welcome. You are looking live at Charlotte Motor Speedway, the road course test for the Bank of America Roval 400. Thanks for watching live on NASCAR.com as well as YouTube. I'm Kim Kuhn alongside Chris Rice, who actually will be crew chiefing this course later in the year. Obviously, crew chief for Ryan Truex at College Racing. We've got a lot to unpack today. Before we get deep dive into the axle tracks, initial thoughts, because last week we had drivers who got to test it. This week, the second of that test. So your thoughts initially. Well, thanks for having me, but I'm so excited because, you know, I tweeted last night or the other day that I'm, I'm pretty excited about the Roval because it's so many different turns, 17 different turns. It's just exciting. We go to Charlotte Motor Speedway and we just, you know, we work on turn one, work on turn two. The weather's so crazy. Turns three and four creates havoc for race teams. And now we get 17 different turns for this race. I'm so excited for the Roval because it's going to make great racing. And we're going to talk about it, how it's going to make great racing and why it's going to make great racing today. So like Chris said, 17 turns. It's a 2.28 mile course, two chicanes. We will run 109 laps on the cups side, which is 250 miles, 400 kilometers, which is just under half of the distance, if you remember last year in the Bank of America 500 when we rode the Oval. Now, last week we had some issues on the track. Some of the drivers were cheating. They were running through a chicane, um, this one to be specific, and NASCAR had to, they didn't modify the track. They just had to set it up this week to make sure the drivers stuck to the course. Your thoughts on that? Well, I like it because let's think about Watkins Glen. You know, you're going down and you're looking at the bus stop. When you come off a of turn 10 here at Charlotte Motor Speedway, I know that's kind of <laughs> tough to say, but you come off a of turn 10, you're going to be you're going to be running somewhere around 125, you know, you're going to get in turn 11 at around 140, 150. If they didn't have the chicane to slow you down, you could be running well over 150, 160 and 13, and then you got to have all these slow parts. It's really tough to set up a race car for the slow parts and the high speed. That, that turn 11 and turn 12 are some of my favorite places because it slows the race down. It's a good passing zone. It's a breaking zone. And also getting out of turn 12 to get into turn 13 is going to be fun to watch. Who gets spun out right there? Who, <laughs> I mean, you know, what happens there? It's going to be really exciting to break down all 17 turns. And like I mentioned last week, they were running through the rumble strips. So NASCAR added additional rumble strips as well as some tire barriers to make sure the drivers stayed on course. But like I mentioned, we're gonna be live streaming all day long. We've got Jonathan Merriman on site at Charlotte Motor Speedway and it seems like we've already got some action happening down there. Jonathan? Oh. The 88 of Alex Bowman, his, uh, his, his guys are running down here towards the, uh, towards the bus stop, Chris, you mentioned. It's 2.28 miles here, 17 turns, but that 100 yards down there at that bus stop is going to cause fits. I've already talked to several drivers today, and they said that that's where they were having the most trouble getting through this thing. Like you said, that long straightaway, it comes down to that 100, 100 yards right there. you got to get down, get through 11 and 12, but uh, we'll let you know. We're going to catch up with Alex later in the day today. We'll ask him what happened down there. Hopefully all is okay with his car so they can continue testing. Uh, so we're getting reports that he's, he's rolling again. He's driving back to the garage. We'll have to catch up with him once he gets back in here, but now I'm going to send it back into you guys. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Alex is actually going backwards right there. He's, he's actually he's going in the out pit road. So if, if you're looking at this at home, he's actually he's going backwards down the coming back to pit road. This is coming out of pit road. So he obviously had a problem in what we would call turn. I think it's turn four probably. So we'll find out what happened to him. But he's going backwards down pit road to, to kind of give you an idea where he was. If you want to throw up the uh, track layout again here in a second, and we'll kind of see if we can figure out where Alex was when he had that incident. And it was interesting because when we were talking with Jonathan before we went live, he had spoken with Alex earlier in the morning after their first run. And Alex had told Jonathan that he wasn't really comfortable after the first run and obviously the second run giving him a few problems too. So um, do we know exactly where Bowman was having the trouble? Yeah, it, it looks like Bowman maybe had some trouble in turn three. It, he probably got the wheel hopping or something crazy. It looked like they raised the hood and, and was able to fix whatever was going on. I know Alex had talked about he wasn't real happy 
at the start. And I've took I, I've been with Alex to a road course. Alex is a good road, road course racer. He's just very, you know, he's got to get up to speed. He's got to figure out what's going on. He has some great teammates. They'll figure it out today. And I, listen, they have four cars at Hendrick Motorsports. They'll better figure it out. <laughs> For sure. Well, like we were mentioning, Jonathan spoke with Alex Bowman early in the morning. Alex wasn't too sure. He also caught up with Chris Busher before we started the test this morning to get Chris's thoughts on all the action today. We're now joined by Chris Busher here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Tell me about this road course. You were on it last week. You're in the wheel force car for Chevy this week. So what's going to be the biggest difference between last week's test and this week's test for you? Uh, you know, last week's test went really good. I got a feel for a track pretty quick, and we had a really good speed, so uh, that was pretty exciting. Come back here for uh, for the wheel force test. It's a little bit different. Um, kind of a nervous wreck with this thing. There's a lot of a lot of money hanging off each corner, and um, you know they're basically just trying to, to gather data out here. So, got to go out here and uh, take it a little easier. Um, you know, try and stay away from some of these these big curbs that are out here. Try and uh, just be easy on this car, but. At the same time, it is nice to get get some laps out here again. Um, you know, the more the better when it comes to, to a new racetrack. And uh, you know, teammates out here, AJ's out here testing as well as long as as well as a bunch of others. But um, you know, be able to to still talk to him, try and get his thoughts, and uh, you know, change some stuff within JTG's organization to to try and get better for this one. So see what he feels about it. And, um, and then at the same time, you know, I get to go out there and make laps and kind of. Kind of see what he's talking about if he comes up with something that's um, that's more efficient than what I was doing last week. Now, last week, the test sessions were split up from the morning session the afternoon session. They added some more rumble strips. What were the biggest things that you felt inside of the car once they added those in and drivers couldn't cut corners as much anymore? Yeah, the um, the main one was just a bus stop, uh, getting uh, getting that one to be an actual bus stop or at least a chicane and not, um, not just a straight through. Um, you know, it, it didn't... It didn't change how how you're getting across curves because the uh, once they put the blue ones in, you know you don't you don't aim for those ones, um, and we weren't we weren't really in that area where they where they installed them anyway. So it didn't change us a whole lot. Um, didn't change our line any, I guess you'd say. Uh, when you're going into the bus stop and you know you know that if you get in there too hot and you do make a mistake, you're gonna you're gonna come across some some pretty massive curves and some tire bear. It'll slow you down a little bit. So. It'll be interesting to see how um, how everyone takes it, where the speeds go from last week. Um, then again, I think we're on a different tire this time around. So, um, you know, I was comfortable on the old tire, so that's unfortunate. But we'll see, uh, we'll see how it works out here today. All right, last question for you. Take the helmet off, put your fan hat on for me. You got a ticket to see this race in the stands. What's that going to be like? It's going to be action all over the place. Yeah, so the uh, the idea behind this is excellent, right? I mean, to, to take a road course and put it all in a, in a self-contained oval where you can go up in the grandstands and you can see 100% of the racetrack, um, you know, at least right now. I know once you get some trailers and campers, you'll have your little blind spots here and there, but the overall view of this place is going to be incredible from a fan standpoint. You know, you've never, never had this opportunity before at, at any of our road course races. Um, you know, I think it opens up windows going forward as well. You know, we got lights here. Um, we, we can uh, we can do that I, I believe um, we don't need uh, we don't need headlights like, like some of the other series and you know it seems like it would um, it would be a possibility going forward uh, we'll just um, a lot of unknowns right now but I, I think it's sure to be uh, it's going to be action packed there's no doubt about that it's just a matter of um, you know how much uh, how much passing gets done cleanly versus uh, versus a little more old school Bristol type feel to it all right Chris Bush is excited the fans are excited I'm excited Kim Chris. Thanks, Jonathan. Now, let's hit on real quickly why Busher's back, because he did say he tested last week in his cup car. Explain quickly why he's back and how it may be not quite an advantage necessarily what he's doing today. Well, he's he's in the Chevrolet Wheel Force car, and we, we hear that a lot, you know, talking about Wheel Force cars, the Toyotas, the Fords. Each manufacturer gets a Wheel Force car so they can learn the tire, learn what kind of air pressure they need, you know, and it gets distributed through all of the big Chevrolet teams, the big Ford teams, and the big Toyotas 
Toyota teams so they can have, they, they're not that fast, they're not as fast as your regular car. You see them always, it's always a wheel force car, WF car. So it's just to learn the tire, to be able to, to get more data, you know, and that's something NASCAR does for all of the manufacturers, you know, to be able to go out and get more data at a test because it's only limited. We don't get much testing, mm -hmm. you know, especially from the Xfinity series. You don't get much testing, but we can learn from what they had going on on the Wheel Force car. If you're just joining us, we want to thank you for tuning in live on NASCAR.com as well as YouTube. And if you missed it, Alex Bowman actually had an early incident in this practice. Right now, Jonathan Merriman is live and has caught up with Alex. Uh, 11 and 12, but that's just where the smoke was. It actually happened in three and four. Alex, what exactly happened out there? I just got loose in and tried to keep it out of the tire barriers. Just got into it a little bit, but it's not too bad. It's just a really awkward section through there where we've been free in throughout the day anyway and tried to work on it, but um, just got in a little too hot and it was KO the tire barriers or spin it out. And I spun it out and still got them a little bit, but um, just part of it. So I think a lot of people are expecting a lot of action, a lot of beating and banging once we get here in the race. For the fans, that's a great thing. You know, you buy a ticket to this race, you're going to see a lot of, of, of on-track action like that. How do you make sure that you keep your stuff intact for the whole 400 km here? Yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, there's pretty much nowhere to pass, so you're just going to have to root the guy in front of you out of the way. So that's going to be, uh, that's going to be tough to keep the bumpers on it and keep the fenders on it, but um, we got a lot of smart people figure out how to do it. I'll uh, hopefully not make that mistake again there, and um, we should be pretty good. We're not terrible. I think we're okay on the board right now. Um, I think we'll be fine. All right, and on a lighter note, he had his 1,000-horsepower Corvette out here. You said Greg wouldn't let you rip on it. Yeah, I didn't spin that one out, though, so it's probably a good thing. That's probably be an expensive one to fix. Alex Bowman, he's going to get this thing fixed up, head back out on track. Thanks, Jonathan. Well, it seemed like Bowman, despite the troubles, is still having a little bit of fun out there. And it's going to be so much fun for fans. I know you are so excited off the top of the live stream. But we want to make sure you go and get those tickets now, fans. So you can go to NASCAR.com slash tickets for the Bank of America Roval 400 race. That happens September 30th. And remember, it's the third race of the first round of the playoffs, which is an elimination race. And not only that, we've got the Xfinity Series running the night before on the 29th. Well, they'll get their shot at the Roval. You'll get your shot. And the cool thing is, though, because it's a playoff race for the Xfinity, the cup drivers aren't allowed in. So how many of those cup <laughs> drivers are going to be buying their tickets right now to watch that Xfinity race to kind of get a lay of the land? You know, we were talking about this before we come on air, and I talked to Martin Truex Jr. a lot during the race, and I feel he will be at the racetrack along with everybody else watching our race. They won't be gone. They'll be sitting there. Okay, what, are they, what can they learn? They'll be listening to the radio. He'll probably be texting his brother throughout that entire race. What did you learn here? What did you learn there? So whoever's their teammate, like RCR or Ralph or even Gibbs, they're going to take everything that they learned the night before and put it to what happens the next day. I'm telling you, it's going to be huge. All the drivers are going to be sitting there watching it. Where can they pass that? Who's going to get wrecked where? Not only that, coming to the finish line, what happens? You know, turn 17, that's a little different. It's not coming off of turn four. It's at turn 17, which is way shorter than turn four. And we're going to break down the track in just a second. How many crew chiefs, though, are going to be coming knocking on your door after you race on the 29th as they prepare for the Bank of America Roval 400. And how much can you really learn as a crew chief or a driver watching another series run for the first time on a track like this? Well, I think they can learn a lot more than what we can tell them for as setups because our setups are quite a bit different, but air pressures are huge. And just what gear they were in later in a run when the tire falls off, the speed falls off. I think all of those things that come in, come in effect. I don't think we can tell them what springs or shocks or anything like that that we ran will help them, but just learning how much you know you use the gas pedal or what your fuel mileage was or things, things like that to be able to happen the next day because I'm telling you still in first, second, third, fourth gear, so it, they will learn throughout the, the race and Xfinity race to go into the cup race. And I'm pretty excited about it because they can't normally learn that much from us. Uh -huh. They will be able to learn. This I can trip. feel your excitement. <laughs> You're smiling from ear to ear. It looks like Jonathan's caught up with another driver. Ryan Blaney is alongside him. Let's see what he has to say. Yeah, Ryan's taking a break right now, but we want to talk about the, the chicane out front turns 15, 16 and 17. 
What's going to make that unique, and, and what are you guys going to be willing to do to, to win this race on the last lap right there? A lot. Um, it's unique enough already, and, you know, you're going so fast. After the bus stop in three and four, the bus stop that leads into big track three and four, I don't know all the turns yet. Uh, you're going so fast there, and you're so hard on the brakes because that's a, such a tight set of corners there that lead on in the front stretch. Um, it, it's going to get pretty wild towards the end of the race if you know people are right there and have a shot to, to win the race. So um, it'll be wild all race, really, not just the end. But that's a really tough set of corners. There's a lot of time to be gaining a loss right there. And, um, and the way they had the curves is it's a kind of a moderate set of curbs and then a really big curb after that so if you hit that big one you lose a bunch of speed and it kind of messes your car all up so you have to be really precise and um, that's going to be hard to do for uh, how long that race is but um, it's, it's been nice we've had a couple runs today and uh, you learn a little bit something new every time you go out so um, it's been it's been fun so far uh, hopefully we can keep learning and uh, the track can I know they're working on the racetrack and, and trying to get it better in some spots so I, I think uh, with these two tests here the last couple weeks um, hopefully we'll have it ready to go here come uh, playoff time. Talk about the heat. It's not going to be this hot when we come back here in, in September, at least we hope not. So what can you glean from this test that will transfer to once we race, you know, the weekend of September 30th? You know, I really think these tests, when you come to a new racetrack, uh, you just, there's multiple things. It's one, the driver's got to learn just how to race it. You know, you never really know you're trying all these new things. You're looking at data. You're watching other cars. Um, you're just trying to figure out how to get around it. You know, we picked up over a second from our first run. You just learn little things once you can kind of sit down and uh, figure out where you can be better. Uh, and as far as the team, they just we try a lot of things. You know, we try a lot of stuff we, we do at normal road courses just to see if it works here. You know, this place is kind of an in-between of Sonoma and Watkins Glen where it's really fast in some parts, but the inner workings of this track is really slow and you have to be uh, really smooth. So... Um, there's just a lot that the team can learn, driver can learn, but even though it's going to be cooler, you know, come come this race, uh, I still think the same things are going to apply with what you need with your car, so uh, it won't be too much different. All right, Rice, I'm interested to see your take, and, and how do you set up a car that's going to run on the banked oval and then also have to run inside that track? How big of a headache is it for you up on the pit box? Knows everyone how excited he is because we never see him smile, right? The only time we ever <laughs> see him smile is when him and Kim are having fun on their podcast. So I, it's very tough. We talk about speed, okay? And he talked about how fast they're running through the chicane mm -hmm. or, or whatever they're going to call it, turns 11 and 12. And you can see on our track map, if you start at the start-finish line, and we'll go through it pretty quick here, start-finish line, you can have turn one which turn one's probably going to be a second gear turn. I think it's going to just change throughout the day. You'll probably stay second. And then what Alex Bowman had an issue with was turn three. He says he's been loose in. And what he means by that is when he gets on the brakes, the back end of the car wants to move around. And sometimes that's difficult to fix. You know, it's kind of tough. You get some different things in the back that you can change, but then go through three and four. All these corners are pretty slow. Then you, you'll probably get into third gear. You'll be running pretty fast through five, still running pretty fast through six. You'll probably gear down to second gear. Would, won't be, it would, will not be a lot of gear changing throughout this back section here. Seven and eight is kind of just normal stuff that you see at a road course. And then you get up on the big banking of nine and 10. And we see at the 24 hours sometimes that, you know, that a lot of passing happens here. But what happens is you want to get your momentum up. You're seeing all the guys getting up to the top of the racetrack. They're not running the bottom because when they come off a of 10, they want to take a good shot down the back straightaway. And then Ryan was talking about a lot of braking going into 11 because you have a lot of speed getting into turn 11, and they were, they was going straight through it, right? But they were kind of just not really braking a lot. Now they got to brake a lot because he says you do not want to hit, or Alex says you do not want to hit the blue ones. Chris Busher, I'm sorry, I'll mm -hmm. get this straight in a minute. You do not want to hit the blue rumple strips because they're really tall. They're not short. 11 and 12, and then you got to come to, through old turns three and four, and now 13 and 14. 15, 16, 17, I believe will be my favorite turn, okay? This is going to be where I, I feel that you can make up the most of your speed. 15, 16, 17, because you're coming to the checkered. I think back to Canada, Marcus Ambrose, all the wrecks that happened there. What happens 
if you go straight through here? What happens <laughs> if you get pushed through the center of that turf? That's grass. That's well, it's turf. Some of it's well, it, some of it's turf and some of it's oh, turf, yeah. Turf so grass. It, it shouldn't tear up your race car, but what happens 15, 16, 17? Because you're going to be carrying a lot of speed into 15, 16, 17. I'm I'm thinking about this right now. Ricky Stenhouse and Kyle Busch come into the checker. <laughs> 15, 16, 17, what happens at that corner? So I'm telling you, I'm, I'm enjoying that corner and what goes on. I feel that's where the race is going to be won both days, Xfinity and Cup, 15, 16, 17. And you will hear me talk about that a lot. I love it. If you're just joining us, thank you. Uh, we're live on NASCAR.com as well as YouTube. And we've got live in studio from Studio 3 as well as live at track action. And Chris has been breaking down stuff for us. Later, he's going to take some questions from the fans. So if you do have a question pertaining to the road course at Charlotte Motor Speedway, be sure to tweet us, log on to your Twitter, and just tweet at NASCAR with those questions. We'll make sure he gets them later. Now, you kind of broke down the track. Ryan Blaney said something interesting in his interview, though. He said, we all have to learn the track. The unique thing about this, yes, we We've got testing. Yes, we'll have practice going into the race weekend, but until we hit those 400 kilometers in the race, these drivers will not have experienced it in a real race condition, meaning it's the first time we'll see 40 cars. How is 40 cars on this track going to be different than what you see in practice and in the testing? Well, even the restarts, we talked about mm -hmm. this, and if you look at 15, 16, and 17, the restarts, the 40th car is going to be a right around turn four, right mm -hmm. at pit entrance and stuff like that. They still have to get through 15, 16, 17. So that's all the little things that you have to work with. You know, we think about the mid-Ohio course that the Xfinity go series goes to. It has a different turn coming to the start finish line. You always see a lot of wrecks there. So where are all 40 cars going to fit on this racetrack? Mm, I'm really curious <laughs> to see. You're going to have a lot of racing. And I, I like what Chris Buescher said. You can get in the grandstands. You can see the entire racetrack. I, I do not feel it'll be any campers in your way here. I still don't feel it'll be any campers anywhere in your way. So if, if you haven't bought a ticket, maybe go buy one right now because I'm pretty interested in maybe staying for the cup race. I might sit somewhere right here because I'm telling you, Rex going to be there and there. I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> tickets, NASCAR.com slash tickets. Again, the race September 30th, the Bank of America Roval 400. Right now, let's go back to the track. We've also got Chase Wilhelm. He's standing alongside Ty Dillon. Thank you. Thank you, Kim and Chris. I'm here with Ty Dillon, driver of the number 13 Jermaine Racing Chevrolet. Now, Ty, you're taking your first laps here. What are a couple takeaways so far early in the session? Uh, it's just so different. Um, you know, very unique to any of the road courses that we run. Um, so for me, it's just kind of easing our way into it. This is our Watkins Glen car, so uh, we're not trying to be overly aggressive. There's been a lot of stories about people crashing here at the test, so I'm trying not to be one of those. But, uh, you know, I'm just easing my way to it, trying to get to more and more speed. We're doing that every time. Just kind of taking our time here this uh, for this test, make sure I get comfortable with the track and slowly building on it for when we come back for the race, we'll be able to chase that speed and, and uh, be able to be aggressive as far as trying to race. Now the big talk is the chicane out in the back straightaway. Uh, they raised the ruffle strips. Uh, what, what, what are your takeaways from there? I'm still just trying to get through there fast. Um, whatever they do, we're all going to have to race on it anyway. So um, however they want to fix it, we'll, we'll figure out how to get through there and be just fine. Now, uh, it's really hot out here today, Ty, and September it might be a little cooler. So what are you guys, guys going to learn that maybe, like, because it's not so hot in September, how does that work as far as testing today? Yeah, your car's going to handle a little bit different when it's cooler and you have a little bit better grip. But, uh, hell, this has actually been pretty cool for uh, the last couple of weeks at the racetrack for us. So um, this feels nice. <laughs> All right, well, Ty's going to keep learning. We're going to get him back on track. He's going to take some more laps. Back to you, Kim and Chris. Thanks, Chase. Uh, and we just learned, actually, we're under a red flag right now. NASCAR apparently is looking at or deciding to remove some of the rumble strips in turn eight. Hopefully, Jonathan Merriman is maybe searching for a NASCAR official to get exactly why they're doing that. Because remember, Chris, this is a work in progress. They haven't ultimately decided exactly what the track is going to look like in terms of tire barriers, rumble strips, and that sort of thing. Like we mentioned last week when they tested, we had drivers that were somewhat cheating the chicane uh, into turn three. So they had to add additional rumble strips. They had to add some tire barriers. So again, this track, a work in progress. You can see right now they're working to remove a few of those rumble strips. Hopefully we'll get uh, a reason as to why. But when they tested last week, a lot of the drivers said 
This 109 lap race is going to be a race of survival. There's going to be a lot of mistakes and the drivers that make the least amount of mistakes have the best shot at winning. So looking at the track, where do you foresee the most number of mistakes being made? Um, they're already telling you. Turns 11 and 12, 15, 16, 17. I feel Alex Bowman is dead on it. Ones, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're going to have to push the guy out of the way. He said root everyone. What he really meant was push the guy out of the way because they're, they're kind of slow corners, but I feel that that's where you're going to see your best racing through the one, two, threes. I mean, all up through the middle of the infield uh -huh. is what I want to call it. So I, I, I feel that racing is going to be well, but like the, the big action will be 11 and 12 and turns 15, 16, 17, because it's not enough room. If we look, when they show the track, it's not enough room to get three, four wide there that you'll see getting into turn one at Watkins Glen. You'll see us get turn three and four wide getting into turn one at Watkins Glen. You're not gonna be able to do that getting into the chicane or I, whatever they wanna call 15, 16, 17. You're, not gonna, you're gonna have to be either single file or side by side, and then you're gonna have to get single file. So, I, those corners, 11 and 12, 15, 16, 17 are, are the corners you're going to see the most havoc. When we go to the road courses being Sonoma, Watkins Glen, now we get to add Charlotte to that list. It's really a spotters race, and these drivers and crew chiefs rely heavily on the spotters. How are the spotters preparing for the race at Charlotte? Outside of being at the test, they'll have the practice. What will they do to make sure they're going to be prepared to guide their driver through these 17 turns? Well, I talked to our spot, spotter, uh, Jason Jarrett, which spots for mm -hmm. Ryan Newman also, and he had talked about what are we going to do and, and what we're actually going to do. We're going to end up putting someone over turn 10 or turn two to be able to see kind of down in this area. And then they will pick a spot to where Jason just is go silent, mm -hmm. right? He doesn't say anything. And this spotter will pick him up until he gets back out to Ryan gets back out and is able to for Jason to see him. So that's what's going to happen. So it'll take two spotters to where we go to Watkins Glen. We end up with four, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't see, but so, certain parts of the racetrack. This racetrack will end up with two spotters because you got that intersection there that is going to be tough. If somebody's inside of it, you don't want to get spun off the racetrack. Stay on the pavement. We always talk about when you go to a road course, all four wheels on the blacktop mm -hmm. and you're going to have a great day. All four wheels on the blacktop, you're going to have a great day. And I can't say that enough. You stay on the black. Ask Alex Bowman. He's already been in the tire barrier, along with Bubba Wallace. So I'm telling you, it's just you stay on the blacktop, you're going to have a good day. Stay on the blacktop. Let's see if Trevor Brain agrees with that piece of advice. Chase is alongside Trevor. Hey, I've caught up here with Trevor Bain in the garage. And Trevor, you tested, you've tested you tested here before, so you're kind of used to this racetrack, but they've made some changes here on the Roval. Talk about what you've noticed so far. Yeah, I feel like this racetrack has evolved every time you hear of a test coming back here. Um, I don't even know how many times they've tested, but uh, I got to come here earlier this year, and it rained out one of the days, so we came back again. And to from that test to today, they've added a lot of uh, high-risk situations to the racetrack. So you've got a barrier back there on the back stretch in between um, the chicane and what's the oval turn three and four, that barrier is pretty risky. Um, used to, if you went through the chicane too fast, you kind of just went off the curb, went straight, no big deal, and you actually found out you can make speed doing that. So you started doing a lap after lap. They saw us doing that, didn't like it, they put a big wall back there. So now you got to make sure you get slowed down, keep it to the right, and, and clear that barrier. So um, as you and I were talking before this, um, and this place does not provide a lot of opportunity just to catch your breath and get your switches right or talk on the radio. It seems like every part of the racetrack uh, has some kind of a spot that could bite you pretty fast, so you got to be careful. So besides the chicane and the backstretch, what are some other areas that you're trying to focus on to maybe get better or that's going to be important in the race? Yeah, uh, there aren't many passing zones in my opinion here. It's going to be really tough to get position on people. Um, with that said, I think coming out of turn eight up onto the banking um, in what's the oval turn one, uh, that's going to be a really big area to get speed and build that down the backstretch. So I think if you can get inside of somebody there, they're going to have to give it to you getting into the bus stop or the chicane on the backstretch. So that's a really important area. Uh, the inner loop probably is going to be a little bit of follow the leader. So you just need to be able to stay on them until you get to that turn eight, um, you know, through turn three and four of the oval, back down onto the front stretch chicane, 
I don't see a lot of opportunity there either. So, as I said, all the areas are important, uh, but only one or two passing zones that I think where you really, really need to focus on your car. Well, that means we're going to have an action-packed race here in September. We'll let Trevor go and take some more laps on the number six Rosh Fenway Racing Ford, and we'll throw it back to you, Kim and Chris. Thanks, Chase. Some good insight from Trevor. Like I mentioned earlier, we're welcoming questions from you, the fans. You can tweet us at NASCAR with your questions for Chris about the Roval. Um, we've got a question from Gary and wanted to know, to prepare for this race, can teams set up on a simulator to prepare their drivers and the teams for what they're going to see at Charlotte? Well, Gary, that's a great question. The problem, you can do that, okay? But the problem is that getting a trap map as fast as we need to get it is going to be tough, but there are going to be teams that you can get on a simulator and do some eye racing or similar to eye racing and stuff like that, which will help like my driver, Ryan Truex. He's going to talk to his brother. He'll talk to all his friends, but to get on a simulator and see the racetrack and do the things he needs to do, you know, get in what gear he needs and how to brake and stuff like that. Yes, you can do that as long as we can get a track map. That is the key to simulating, okay? You have to have a tra track map, and we have to, as they're changing the racetrack today, that's going to change your track map, right? So um, just getting a track map track map is going to be tough. That's tough. <laughs> it's a to tongue out. twister. It's a tongue twister. Like I mentioned, this is very unique because this road course will fall in the playoffs. First time we've seen a road course in the playoffs again, September 30th, the Bank of America Roval 400. My question to you, Chris, this is unique, not only because we have a road course in the playoffs, but it's a unique track. It's really a road course within an oval. So looking forward to the teams or drivers that may excel on this are you looking at the guys that traditionally owned cms and were great at cms or are you looking at the guys that are awesome road course racers or maybe a little bit of both well we talk about it on the nascar preview show all the time the top three who's the top three mtj martin Truex jr kevin harvick and kyle bush I feel those three will be right there. <laughs> but we also have to look at Clint Boyer, always great at Sonoma. And, and you've heard him talk about, hey, this is Sonoma versus Watkins Glen. So I'm telling you, the road course races that you've seen been that have been great, I think will still be great at this place. But also it's going to throw in a mix of different drivers that you normally don't see. You know, I think AJ will do a great job there, but it's not going to be just road course drivers and it's not going to be your mile and a half drivers and it's not going to be your short track drivers. But I still the big three right now <laughs> will be the big three when we come to the Roval for sure. I love it. But you threw Clint Boyer in that mix. I'm so glad to hear that because Jonathan Merriman is alongside Clint and I'm sure Clint has got some great insight into what he's seeing at the Charlotte Motor Speedway road course. He's got great insight, yeah, but yesterday, I mean, you were chilling in the pool, had a koozie and a cowboy hat on. What are you doing out here today? Working. <laughs> Back to work. Trying to figure this place out. Let me tell you, that's a sketchy racetrack. Um, there is no margin for error anywhere. Like, literally, getting on the racetrack off the pit road is, is sketchy. It's, uh, it's tight quarters all the way around, um, and that's by yourself. Oh, by the way, there's going to be... 39 other maniacs out there with you when we come back here still trying to figure the track out i guess they had some uh some curbing coming up a little bit so they just took it out i'm um, gonna go out and see what that that means as far as that goes but uh um, just trying to figure the track out you know I, I haven't been down here i didn't do the test earlier i haven't been down here in a car or anything so i've got a lot of room to go on my end but uh the room is is marginal, and I'm telling you, like literally every corner, you're tiptoeing because if you slip the least little bit, you're in big trouble. All right, so Chris Rice, our crew chief at NASCAR.com, has a question for you. Chris, what's your question? I'll relay it to Clint. Ask him, will this be a big aero track, or will he be able to tear the front bumper off and still win the race? Because I know he will use the front bumper from Martinsville and all the other road courses. Will he be able to do that? He wants to know, is this going to be an aero track, or are you going to tear the front bumper off of it to win it because it's like Martinsville and you're pretty good there? You're not going to tear the front bumper off this thing anywhere. I mean, you're carrying it. It's fast. It, you know, it's a fast racetrack all the way around, especially when you get onto the regular racetrack in one and two and three and four. I mean, you're talking fourth gear wide open fast. And, um, you know, I, I walk in Glen up through the S's and getting into uh, this came back there kind of feels like that. 
But oh, by the way, if you slide off a track there, you just kind of go through the grass, no harm, no foul, and jump back on the racetrack and make sure nobody saw you doing it. Uh, here, they're going to see you doing it because they're going to be picking tires and everything else off of you for about uh, the next hour and a half, it looks like, if you go off the chain back there. <laughs> All right. Hey, I want to know why he ain't working. <laughs> he doesn't work. It's Chris Rice. We, we just have him on retainer all the time. Chris, Cam, back to you. He's doing what he's best at, talking. <laughs> Amen. Tell him thanks. <laughs> I love that. You always know you're going to get the truth, whether you like it or not, from Clint Boyer. Anything stand out in terms of what he said? Yeah, ask me why I wasn't working. No. <laughs> the funny part was he says it's fast. It's like up through the S's, and, and it's just crazy fast, which kind of blows me away because I've been talking about how slow it is through the middle section. So, Clint Boyer will always tell you the truth. If you ever want to get to the racetrack and talk to someone that is fun to talk to, is Clint Boyer. But he's going to tell you the truth. So if you don't want to get your feelings hurt, don't go talk to Clint Boyer. Trust me. <laughs> We're going to show you some at-track action. Again, thank you for tuning in live on NASCAR.com as well as YouTube. We're in Studio 3 breaking down the Charlotte Motor Speedway road course for the Bank of America Roval 400. And like I mentioned, a lot of on-track action. Let me know if anything stands out to you as you watch those drivers kind of figure out this track for the first time. Well, I, I'm, I'm enjoying watching this because I'm just like every other fan. We don't get to see this a lot. So, you know, watching Eric Jones here drive around the middle section of the racetrack. If you don't, it's, oh, whoa, some elevation that happens there. He goes probably off camera, you know, and, and like, that. Where did he go? Yeah, where did he go? So just watching how they're attacking the racetrack and doing the things they need to do. We see Joey Logano probably just taking off, getting ready to make a run, but just how the racetrack right here, it's gonna, you're going to lose him. He goes away. So I'm telling you, just different aspects of this racetrack versus all the other road courses is what's so unique about the Robo, I feel. Back up on the banking. I mean, the big banking of turn one where I'm used to seeing Ron Truex drive down in there. We see Eric Jones Ooh. sliding the brakes. So talking about how fast it is. The reason they slide the brakes there, the tire gets really light. So he's on the brakes, it's kind of on the right rear, the left front's up and he slides the brake. You know, and that's something at College Racing we work at really hard with Ryan of what kind of brake package do you need? And this is just telling the guys, hey, I need a different kind of brake package to be able to go, you know, faster or do what we need to do, you know, at the Roval. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to watch this. I'm excited about it in general. And again, just to recap, we're looking at the Charlotte Motor Speedway road course for the Bank of America Roval. 417 turns, 2.28 miles. We talked about that elevation change, 35 feet in terms of the elevation change, two chicanes. And we'll watch as drivers continue to work their way through this test. I'm loving Austin Dillon is learning the racetrack because they're part of our alliance. And, and you know, Austin has come a long ways in his road course race. And I know he's worked really hard at getting better and better and better at the road courses. But just watching him, he's going through the back straightaway chicane is what we called it, up into turn four. Um, that corner right about there gives everybody trouble when it's the big mile and a half. It looks like Austin's doing just fine. Now he's into 15, 16, and 17. This will be coming home for the win. Uh, see how slow it is right there. So you know when you get slow, normally what happens, they beat doors. And then we're down into turn one. So hard on the brakes, back to the gas. You know, make sure you're not sliding your rear wheels. Austin, right around the bottom of turn two. Now back to the right, turn three. Oh my goodness, you, you, like they said, you don't have much time to think about what's next. So uh, that 35 over the rumple strips, I, I, I'd like to see that. So this is pretty cool to watch, Kim. Yeah, we saw uh, that turn four and you mentioned drivers have trouble with that just during the mile and a half race on Charlotte's Oval. And then we have that kind of little bit of a bump before we hit the start finish line. Will drivers be able to get a big run off of the exit of turn three into turn four just because you're on the banking. You maybe have a little bit more throttle time there before you have to break getting into um, turns 15, 16, 17. Kim's got me a little messed up that she was talking about 13 and 14. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. We watch Austin. Well, yeah, Austin, now he's getting ready to own turn three. So he's staying right on the bottom. So I don't think that that's a big of speed advantage as staying to the top, getting the run like you were talking about. He's keeping it. He's cutting all corners. He's making the distance as small as he can. So 
I don't know that that is going to be as big as like turn the old turn two. So um, I, I would be really curious to see the distance, you know, how much it is from the top to the bottom. But it's about momentum from the top to the bottom and you get some momentum. So I don't think turn 14 to 15 is going to be as much as 10 to 11. I know I got to get used to those turn numbers because I still consider this turn three and turn four of the oval is actually turns 13 and turns 14 of the road course at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Again, we're live in Studio 3 as well as live at track Charlotte Motor Speedway's road course testing. We're going to let you guys enjoy some of the on track action right now. All right, back in the garage here, we have some answers as to what was going on during that bit of a red flag situation. I spoke with NASCAR, and right here in turn eight, they're removing rumble strips. Now, I was assured that these were not there for safety like the ones up here in turn 11 and 12 that they added halfway through the test session last week. What they were doing here is they're removing some rumble strips that had some wear. They're trying to eliminate some wear and tear on the cars. These will not be replaced so, Chris Rice, my question for you is, now that those rumble strips are out of the question, that's one less area for your driver to get up on those and hurt the car, how much is a relief for you up on the pit box knowing that that's one less set of rumble strips that your car is going to be ramping off of when they hit the track here? Well, I, I enjoy that they took the rumble strips away, but if you look at it, it's kind of like it reminds me of Sonoma. And when they come out of the turn and they're headed straight into the wall, mm -hmm. you look at that, you look at, yeah, the cement concrete, part. It's yeah. concrete. So when we get too wide or whatever, they're going to be cutting this even sharper. Maybe put some tires here to be able to put some safety back. This doesn't pose any issue whatsoever. Maybe shortcutting it to get into turn one or oh, whatever corner they're calling it now, but turn one. So this doesn't create any issue. I'm glad they got rid of them because it really wasn't anything to be able to, to affect the car, you know, coming out of turn eight because they're already wide here, making the turn up on the banking or whatever they're going to do there. Too wide is going to be a little tough because of that cement area, mm -hmm. but maybe some tires or something to put some safety back into it. Again, fans, thanks for tuning in and watching our live stream of the Charlotte Motor Speedway Road Course Test for the Bank of America Roval 400. A lot of new things being thrown at drivers, including pit road and how you're going to enter that. So walk us through how different it is from when we race the mile and a half oval of Charlotte Motor Speedway. Well, the mile and a half oval at Charlotte Motor Speedway is normally just grass. It's just a wide open pit road. Like when I tell Ryan Truex to leave pit road, he, he can get out in the grass if he needs to. Now it's a wall there. So it's going to be like the maybe the California, if you're lo looking at California, it's a wall on the outside of pit road. So you got to maneuver around the wall. It's not a big deal, but just visual, visual of the driver. Now you have a wall, as you can see, it's a wall. It will be all the way down pit road. Um, obviously they're going to have some racing there tonight at Charlotte Motor Speedway. So you'll have the wall that's going to kind of take up some room on pit road, but Charlotte Motor Speedway has a wide pit road. It will not bother the drivers that much other than visual, you know, so. Will it, though? You said it won't bother the drivers too much, but think about what some of the drivers said. They said there's not a lot of opportunities to pass on track. We're going to be looking at pit road and pit stops to pass other drivers. So that adds another element of stress as they come down pit road. Could those walls affect the opportunity to pass cars? Well, let's think about it. You know, we talk about stage racing mm -hmm. and things that happen in NASCAR. This is not going to be your typical, we're going to run the stage out and just get to the end of the stage. You're going to run that race backwards. So you're going to have some green flag stops. So getting into pit road, could somebody wheel hops? Could somebody spin out? Could something happen to those guys getting on pit road? I'm telling you that that this race is going to be so different that it's going to change up the way you look at Charlotte Motor Speedway mm -hmm. coming back in 2019. Will this race produce what we've seen in the all-star race or <laughs> something like that? You know, so green flag stops on pit road will be different, but I still feel they're the best of the best, you know, so that wall's not going to affect them that much. Just when do they pit? How do they pit? Do they have wheel hop? Mm -hmm. Do they have the brakes too hot? It's a lot of scenarios that the drivers have to think about, you know. So I, I, I like that it's a wall there. I've always liked that at any racetrack because of somebody spinning out, coming. 
into pit road while a pit crew member sweeping the pit road or anything like that. So. Yeah, I'm glad they put a wall there. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the stages for this race. Again, it's a 109 lap race, which puts us just under 250 miles, 400 kilometers. That's why it's the Bank of America Roval 400. But those stage breaks come at lap 25, lap 50, and then an ending at 109. So 25, 25, and then 59 laps. So we had a great question from Rubbins Racing. As a crew chief, how do you calculate fuel mileage, especially considering it's a road course and you have to work backwards when it's a completely new track? Well, you just, it's fuel mileage. It's just like anything. If you're driving down the highway and you're going to a different place or you're doing something different, that you, you just, it's fuel mileage. So if you get five miles to the gallon or you get six miles to the gallon, we know how long the track is after they have the testing. So it's, it's just basically fuel mileage, just like you do in your regular car. If you're going to town or if you're going 100 miles down the road, it's still just fuel mileage and you know how far you can go. We have great engineers that tell us, oh, you can go to this lap or you can go to this lap, plus you're gonna run out in turn three. So yeah, it's just basically fuel mileage and now learning how much, the, how big the track is with all the changes, that'll tell us how much fuel mileage we have. And we have a test with the Xfinity Series before we get in there, mm -hmm. so that'll also give us some fuel mileage. Well, we just got a note that Ryan Blaney, we talked to him earlier and he mentioned how hard it was to learn a new track. Ooh. We actually got into the wall somewhere in the infield, so clearly having a little trouble working his way through this no, new road course layout. Um, yeah, not looking good for Ryan. No, that doesn't look good at all. And, and obviously it happened through that section through the middle part of the racetrack because he was driving around through the back straightaway and that's turn four, old turn four now, uh, turn three, sorry, now turn 13. So uh, definitely not a good day because now your test is gone. Do they have a backup? Um, probably, but they also have, you know, basically four teams with the alliance of the 21 car. So maybe they don't, you know, they just come off a run in Sonoma and had all the other races. So maybe they do not, you know, um, it's, that's a tough deal because you're trying to get all you can get out of the race car. You know, Ryan Truex and I talk about this all the time. He probably, that was his best race car for the test. Like if they do pull one out, it'll be a little different or something changed about it. So just looking at it, maybe probably got loose and backed it into the wall or, or something like that. If Merriman gets there and we can, we can see some video of it, maybe we can see exactly what went on. But um, I see, you see the team there rolling up the, the tarp Maybe mm -hmm. they do have a backup. You know, it's Team Penske that, that's their test hauler because their regular hauler is trying to get ready to sure. be able to get to New Hampshire. It's got to leave on Thursday morning, Wednesday night. So um, it's just, uh, that's a tough situation. Uh, yeah, yeah, they probably can fix that one. Yeah, you know? it doesn't look too bad. But we also don't know what's going on underneath all that in you know, terms of did it damage any of the structure of the race car? I would fix that because it's a test and NASCAR doesn't tell us what to do. Maybe put a bumper cover on it. They could be <laughs> ready for the for the second part of the test in the afternoon. Um, you know, um, but obviously Penske, that's a that's a good group. It's a lot of people. They're close to home. They could bring in a ton of fabricators. They could knock it out. And uh, but Hey, it's Ryan Blaney. He's getting all he can. That's not a points paying test. It's nothing other than you're trying to do what you can do to learn the most for your race team. And, and things like that are going to happen, you know. So, uh, and they're telling us that this is a tough racetrack. It's fast yeah. and you're wheel hopping and crazy things are going on. Obviously very frustrating, although, again, it's not a race weekend, so this isn't a points-paying event where you would really have um, something to lose. Let's go live. Jonathan Merriman's in the garage and give us an update on what's happening with Ryan Blaney's number 12 Team Penske car. Yeah, Chris, this thing, uh, and Kim, this thing took a heck of a lick to the uh, left rear quarter panel. You can see this thing's dinged up pretty bad. The whole filler neck of the gas tank is kind of at a completely different angle. Uh, I mean, I'm not a mechanic, not a crew chief, Chris, but when you see damage like this before and after, uh, you know, that, that fender opening, it looks like this rear end took one heck of a lick. Obviously, the crew's going up under the car right now, but when you climb up under this thing, what kind of stuff do you look for in terms of, of making sure that everything's square in that rear end that needs to be there? Well, you look at, you know, like truck arms, and when we talk about truck arms, it's, it's a, it's a two-link car, basically, that holds the rear end in, and you make sure they're not bent, any safety issues, anything that goes on up under the car that, that they're doing from the track bar to be able to hold the car, you know, side to side. So... 
And, and normally they have a bunch of parts. As long as it doesn't bend the main frame of the race car, you know, um, normally they can fix it. That looks like, to me, it looks like they might be going to try to fix it. Like I said, it's a test. You put a rear bumper on it, put a quarter panel on it, um, and you can still get some of your tests in. How do you go about setting up a race car? Because like we mentioned, it's a road course within an oval. So there are still aspects of the track that are uh, likened to the oval, but then obviously some intense turns on the road course section. So as a crew chief, the setup, how challenging is that? Well, it, we were talking about doing this show earlier and you guys were talking about doing the show and I was thinking about what right rear spring we were going to run there. So. Um, you know what? We lean on our engineers a lot. You know, we have, uh, they, they'll tell us after this test of what kind of rear springs you need to run, what kind of front mm -hmm. springs you need to run, bump stops, and, uh, and all the stuff that goes on in, in our packages. But uh, the main thing is the driver. Like, once the driver gets out there and tells us, you know, hey, I'm loose here, you know, we need to move the rear roll center down or maybe put some nose weight in mm -hmm. it or something like that. But a lot of this, we get to run three road courses coming up. We will take what we learned at those road courses and bring it to the Robles. So a lot of that that you learn at those places will transfer into the Roval, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the, from what I understand, it looks like it's going to be like more of a Watkins Glen. So when we get to Watkins Glen and places like that, we'll take that set up, you know, and I spent a little time talking to Ryan about that and, and having speed, having the arrow, not knocking the front bumper off like Clint Boyer said, you know, is going to be key, but also being able to make the turns. I watch the cars now. I've been watching them on TV, how they roll and how they move. So they're not worrying too much about the splitter and, sure. you know, and making sure the splitter's good and flat. So um, I'm pretty excited to get digging into what we're going to do with our setup and how we're going to make things right and be able to get the most speed out of the race car in turns 15, 16, <laughs> 17. <laughs> well, we had mentioned the added pressure on this track because not only is it a new track for the drivers, but it's the last race of the first round of the playoffs, meaning this racetrack right here, this road course at Charlotte Motor Speedway is going to be an elimination race and certainly could pose some potential extra pressure for a guy like Eric Jones, who's already locked himself into the cup playoffs. Yeah, Kim, Eric Jones here, obviously nice trim, Eric Jones. He's got uh, no more mullet, if you notice that, but that's not what it's important here. What's important is this will be an elimination race in the playoff, added pressure. It's the first time any of you guys will be racing on this track. So what's that going to be like? What are the nerves going to be like for a guy who just locked himself in? Well, I mean, hopefully we're in a good spot to advance without needing this race, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be nerve-wracking. I mean, it's kind of an unknown for everybody, and it's a tough track, and we've already seen a lot of cars torn up here, so it's been uh, it's been challenging for everybody, but, you know, it's still an opportunity to win, and I think anybody's just got as good of a shot, so hopefully we can be the ones that, uh, that do that, and, you know, it sure feel good to win a uh, uh, the first road course race here. So what's the balance here in practice to make sure you keep your car out of trouble, you know, out of the fence, but also make sure that you're getting enough to, to know that when you come back here that you have something that'll, that'll compete? Well, today's the day to learn. You know, if you're going to tear one up, you never want to, but, you know, today would be the best day to do it if it's going to happen. So we're trying to keep it in one piece, though, obviously, and just learn as much as we can. We've already picked up a lot of time. I, I think we've picked up close to a second from our first run of the day to now. So there's still a little bit more to go to really be with the, the 18. Kyle's really fast today. Um, but we're, we're getting closer, you know, road courses aren't my thing really necessarily. And, uh, um, this is my first time here. A lot of these other guys have been here before already. So just learning as we go and, uh, and trying to figure it out. All right. It's a big learning experiment here for the 20 team locked himself in at Daytona. He's going to make sure he doesn't get cut out of the playoffs here when we come back in September. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh, the mullet's gone. Shocker. All Stocker business now. No more party. <laughs> no more party, but I, party. But I was talking about. He said Kyle Busch is fast. I know. Shocker, yeah. everyone. Shocker. Shocker. And you had mentioned the big three are still probably going to be the big three when we hit this race come September again. September 30th, the Bank of America Roval 400. Mark your calendars, fans. And why not just log on and get tickets right now? You can do that at NASCAR.com/tickets. My question to you, Chris. You've had the opportunity to hear what some drivers said. I know you brought up your timing and scoring to get, get an idea of what they're running. You've seen the issues they were having. Now, again, the Xfinity Series is going to run this course, too, on September 29th before the Cup Series takes it on on September 30th. What are you going to tell Ryan 
as he goes in for his first test here, and then as you guys move into race ready mode. Well, this will be the second race of our playoffs, okay? So that's going to be key what we tell Ryan, but also the things that we're going to tell him is we got to get to the end, right? I, I feel as we as we keep going through the season, we have up, ups and downs and stuff like that, but I'm telling you, when we get into the playoffs, this is going to be a key race for the mm -hmm. first three for the Xfinity Series, just like it's a cutoff race for the Cup Series. So I, you have to stay on the pavement, but also we have to have our car great to be able to make passes and things like that because all Xfinity drivers in there, it's a good shot to be able to win, get some stage points, win some stages, but also you got to play the race. Hey, do you want to win? Are you, is your car good enough to win? So I think just differences of where you're running at will change who wins stages, who doesn't win stages, but staying on that blacktop, Mm -hmm. Not getting off in the grass, like Clint Boria said, <laughs> is going to be key, 100% key. Yeah, and that race, obviously a little bit shorter. It's 200 kilometers, 55 laps. And I have a feeling Chris is going to scurry back to your office and be making some notes. I'm actually here. probably going to go by there. <laughs> <laughs> so. Let's check back in at track. Jonathan and Chase are going to wrap things up for us. Final thoughts, guys? Yeah, it's been an eventful day for sure, and we haven't really been out here that long. We've had a couple of caution slash red flags, once for Bowman, once for Blaney. Uh, Blaney's car is pretty torn up pretty badly. Alex Bowman's car looks fixable. But, Chase, what have been your takeaways? You've been running all over the place out here. Well, talking to the drivers, one is the chicane on the back stretch, two is the changes they made in turn eight with the rumble strips. And also, Trevor Bain also talked to me about not being able to really have a lot of time to talk to his team because of how on the edge these cars are on this road course. So that's going to be really interesting team communication uh, come September to try to, to talk about the car. And it's high intensity out there for sure. All right, so when I hear all of that, I think it's a win. It's a win for the fans, A, because you can see everything here at this racetrack from every seat in the grandstands. And if you can imagine, Trevor Bain's got his hands full with no cars around him. There's going to be 40 of these guys out on the racetrack come September, so make sure you get your tickets. It's going to be absolutely insane. Stay logged on to NASCAR.com all day long. Chase is going to be catching up with Joey Logano and A.J. Allmendinger, but we're going to wrap it up right here, right now from track. Kim, Chris, back to you. Thanks, guys. Hopefully you're staying cool out there. I know it's warm. Some final thoughts from you, Chris. I love it. I love it. I love it. I think that it's going to be key that you learn all that you can learn this week at that test. Take it back. Study it. Study it. Study it. But also, for all the Xfinity drivers that's listening and watching, make sure that you talk to all the drivers. I love what's going on for the fans and what's going on for the race teams. I feel that it's just going to be a great race, and it's – it's been really exciting to watch because we got a, I got an inside of it. Sitting here watching it has been really cool. I love it. Chris Rice, thank you so much for joining us in Studio 3. Fans, thanks for watching on NASCAR.com and YouTube. We're signing off, but don't go anywhere because the live coverage is going to continue until 12 noon on NASCAR.com. And then we'll pick it up back after lunch on our YouTube channel from 1 to 5. You can catch all the action. And why not go ahead and buy tickets now? You've heard us talk all morning long how great the action is going to be. You saw some of the action right on screen so you can go to nascar.com slash tickets to get your tickets for September 30th and the running of the Bank of America Roval 400 again an elimination race in the playoffs for the Cup Series drivers but again continue coverage on nascar.com until 12 and then 1 to 5 on YouTube and join the conversation tweet us at NASCAR.